Hello everyone and welcome to Creature Archives. Today we're continuing the series Evolved Fiction. In this series, I take iconic creatures from movies, myths, and games and reimagine them through the lens of real-world evolution and biology, seeing just how close real life could get to turning fantasy into reality. In today's episode, I'll be tackling one of the most heavily requested creatures for the series, and honestly, the one I've been dreading the most, Godzilla. This isn't just another monster, it's THE monster. A cultural icon that has embodied the fear of nuclear weapons, the fury of nature, and unstoppable destruction for over half a century. So how on earth do you even begin to take something so massive and so unrealistic and try to rebuild it with real-world biology? And how would such a creature live and what impact might it have on history? Get ready because all of these questions and more will be answered in this episode of Creature Archives. Before we go any further, I want to make a few clarifications. In this video, we are exploring just how close we could theoretically get in real life to Godzilla. That means, no, this creature will by no means be our perfect replica. We are subjecting it to the limits of real-world physics and biology. And on the flip side, no, this animal wouldn't realistically evolve on Earth, because many of the traits it will have simply wouldn't be necessary for survival. This is about plausibility, not probability. With that in mind, I have set four goals for building our real-life Godzilla. First, it should maintain a bipedal reptilian stance while being adapted for a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Second, it should be as large as possible while still being able to walk on land, at least for short periods of time. Third, it should in some way be able to feed on or utilize radiation. And finally, it should have an offensive ability that looks visually similar to Godzilla's iconic atomic breath. To start with our first goal, we need to find a real species that can give us the right base body frame to evolve from. Something reptilian, semi-aquatic, and most importantly, capable of growing large while still having the anatomical foundation for a bipedal stance. When we look back into prehistory, one group of animals stands out above the rest, the Spinosaurids. These massive theropods were among the largest carnivores to ever walk the Earth, uniquely adapted for a semi-aquatic lifestyle. With long crocodile-like snouts, conical teeth, and features suited for swimming, they specialized in hunting fish and thrived in riverine and coastal environments. Crucially, they combined these aquatic adaptations with a bipedal dinosaur body plan, making them an ideal evolutionary launch pad for a creature that lives both on water and on land, while retaining a form reminiscent of Godzilla. For our purposes, we will imagine a lineage of spinosaurs that didn't just stay confined to inland rivers, but eventually began migrating along coastlines and even across open oceans. Much like how modern crocodiles can travel long distances by sea, some spinosaur populations colonize distant shores. And some of these environments, such as the Kerala coast of southwest India, a place known for its naturally higher background radiation, will set the stage for the unusual evolutionary pressures that will shape our Godzilla's evolution. Now that we've established our base body plan, let's talk about just how big this animal could realistically get. The main advantage here is that Godzilla spends most of its time in the water. Buoyancy helps reduce the effect of weight pressing down on its skeleton, which means it can grow significantly larger than a fully terrestrial animal. However, it still needs to be able to come onto land, and that's where the limits really start to kick in. For reference, the largest recorded land animal ever was Argentinosaurus, estimated at around 120 feet long and weighing over 70 tons. That's essentially the hard ceiling of what bone, muscle, and physics have ever been able to support on land. However, this isn't to say that our creature could even get this big. Sauropods possess several key adaptations to allow this size that simply wouldn't work very well in a theropod. Their column-like legs were arranged directly beneath the body, acting like massive pillars to bear weight efficiently. Their long necks let them feed without moving their whole bulk, reducing energy expenditure, and they also had an extensive system of air sacs that pneumatized their bones, reducing skeletal weight while maintaining strength. And perhaps most importantly, their bodies were balanced around a wide four-legged stance, distributing their mass evenly. Bipedal theropod, by contrast, relies on a much narrower support base, with its entire body weight resting on just two limbs. Its posture demands a heavy muscular tail for counterbalance, and its frame isn't built for the same kind of vertical load bearing. To work around this sum, our Godzilla would evolve a reinforced skeleton, with bones made denser and tougher by incorporating trace minerals like strontium or iron, much like how some fish and mollusks build with exotic biominerals. Inside, however, it would retain a bird-like air sac system, similar to that of sauropods. These air sacs would extend through its vertebrae and ribs, reducing weight while allowing efficient flow through breathing and helping to vent excess heat from such a massive body. Unlike sauropods, though, their distribution would be more selective, lightening the skeleton enough for some terrestrial movement without compromising buoyancy control in the water. Even with these adaptations, movement on land would have to be slow and deliberate. This creature would be a faculative biped, meaning it could switch between walking on its hind legs and walking on all fours, 
on land, quadrupedal locomotion would spread its immense weight more safely across its limbs. But when threatened or displaying dominance, it could rear back onto its hind legs, bracing with its tail to strike the unmistakable silhouette of Godzilla. So, where does that leave us? With all the physics in play, the most realistic upper limit would probably be around 75 feet in length, with a hip height of 24 feet, and a maximum reared-up display height pushing up to 36 feet at the head. Now, if we push things further and allow this creature to be fully aquatic without the burden of supporting itself on land like Godzilla, its size ceiling could rise dramatically, potentially reaching 130 feet in length and upwards of 200 tons making it the largest vertebrate to ever live. However, unless it shifted from being a predator to a filter feeder like the blue whale, sustaining itself at that size would be a nearly impossible task. This is why we don't see predators reach such extreme proportions in nature. It's simply impractical and unnecessary for their survival. So for this video, in the spirit of creating a creature that looks and behaves more like Godzilla, and not just a big reptilian whale, we will be using the smaller semi-aquatic size. Now obviously this size is much smaller than the towering skyscraper-sized monster from the films, but make no mistake, this would still be something unprecedented. Our realistic Godzilla wouldn't just be one of the largest dinosaurs, it would be the largest terrestrial predator to ever walk the Earth. And now we move to the third and perhaps most challenging category. Our Godzilla must in some way be able to utilize radiation. Now, you might be wondering, is it even possible for a creature to feed on radiation? And the answer is surprisingly yes. In nature, some organisms already exploit radiation. Radiotrophic fungi, such as the black mushrooms thriving near Chernobyl, contain melanin that allows them to absorb ionizing radiation and convert it into chemical energy. Certain microbes also use radiation indirectly, driving reactions that split water molecules or generate reactive chemicals like hydrogen peroxide through a process called radiolysis. So in theory, it isn't far-fetched to imagine a vertebrate evolving something similar. But here's the problem. For an animal of Godzilla's size, directly converting background radiation into usable energy even in an area with artificially raised radiation levels like Chernobyl, wouldn't even come close to contributing to the energy needed for a 30-ton body. The energy yield is simply too small to matter. Instead, our Godzilla wouldn't be using radiation as fuel at all, but as a source of reactive chemicals. By targeting environments where radiation naturally produces concentrated radiolytic byproducts, it could exploit these compounds for another purpose. And nature actually provides such places. Coastal monazite sands, like those along the Kerala coast of southwest India, are naturally enriched with thorium-bearing minerals, making them some of the highest background radiation areas on Earth. In these sediments, ionizing radiation slowly radializes pore water, creating steady traces of reactive oxidants like hydrogen peroxide. Over time, dense microbial mats colonize these beaches, concentrating the radiolytic products into biofilms. For a lineage of Godzilla-like ancestors, these chemically-enriched habitats would have offered a unique niche to exploit. Crucially, these coastal radiation hotspots are also long-lived. Geological processes can maintain placer deposits for hundreds of thousands or even millions of years, providing stable and predictable resource bases across evolutionary time. And they weren't unique to India, either. Whenever rivers carried radioactive minerals to ancient seas, along the Cretaceous coast of Gondwana, the Paleogene shores of South America, or the Neogene margins of Africa, similar radiation-rich beaches would have formed. Over millions of years, Godzilla's ancestors could have tracked these shifting coastlines migrating from one enriched shoreline to the next, as sea levels and continents changed. Natural selection would then refine their adaptations for this lifestyle. Broad muscular snouts could scrape microbial mats and sediments, specialized preconcentrator glands could filter pore water, extracting and concentrating the reactive molecules, and reinforced storage sacs lined with protective proteins could safely contain these volatile compounds until needed. Individuals better at locating radioactive patches, farming microbial mats, and stockpiling these chemicals would have left more offspring, pushing the lineage further down this path. But this still leaves one big question. Why go through all this trouble? If radiation isn't fueling their metabolism, what are these chemicals for? Well, they actually set the stage for one of our creature's most extraordinary abilities, a weaponized system that harnesses the environment itself, bringing us to our next section, the biology and chemistry behind Godzilla's signature atomic breath. Now, full disclaimer, unlike Godzilla in the movies, which unleashes a literal nuclear blast, our creature won't be doing that. It's quite frankly just not biologically possible. Instead, it produces a biologically plausible but still incredibly powerful chemical attack that is only made possible by radiation. Here's how it works. As mentioned before, the creature gathers the raw materials from radioactive sands and microbial mats. Specialized preconcentrator glands filter pore water, concentrating oxidants like hydrogen peroxide, 
and storing them in reinforced sacks until needed. When it's ready to fire, the stored solution is pumped into a throat water sack, essentially a living chemical boiler. Inside, the peroxide mixes with organic reductants and transition metal catalyst, primarily iron and manganese complexes embedded in the sack walls. Melanin-like pigments amplify the process, responding to radiation by generating additional radicals and recycling the catalyst. The result is a rapid exothermic reaction that releases intense heat and pressure, superheating the water into a volatile mixture of scalding steam and reactive chemicals. Temperatures in the sack could spike well above boiling, producing jets that are not just hot, but corrosive and highly destructive. To contain such forces, the throat would need extraordinary adaptations. Thickened keratinized lining and heat-resistant proteins would insulate against scalding damage, layers of muscular valves could control the release of pressure with precision, preventing accidental discharge, and finally, the mouth itself would be equipped with a hardened nozzle, a single reinforced opening for a focused lance of superheated spray. The range of these blasts would vary. Short defensive bursts might only project a few meters, while larger concentrated dischargers could travel dozens of meters, easily reaching prey or rivals at a distance. The most powerful jets would resemble a directed flamethrower of scalding vapor and oxidants, capable of stunning and killing schools of fish, injuring large predators, or forcing even the boldest competitors to back down. In short, our Godzilla's atomic breath isn't nuclear, but it is a weaponized fusion of chemistry, anatomy, and radiation. Radiation doesn't fuel its body, but it supercharges the decomposition of peroxide, turning seawater into a devastating high-temperature attack. And there you have it, our biologically grounded Godzilla, introducing Thermoradiosaurus Colossus. With its anatomy and unique adaptations established, we can now explore how this giant lived, hunted, and even influenced the course of history. Thermoradiosaurus colossus are a long-lived apex predator, with lifespans ranging from 500 to potentially over 1,000 years. These creatures are primarily solitary and extremely territorial, interacting only during mating season and during territorial disputes. Reproduction is highly selective. Females produce one to three offspring per cycle and invest extensively in each. Parental care includes guarding hatchlings, guiding them to safe radiolytic patches, and teaching the basics of hunting using their chemical-based predation system. Adults maintain vast territories encompassing both rich prey and radiolytic sands for chemical harvesting. These territories can cover up to 100 square miles of ocean. This makes conflicts between fully grown individuals rare but catastrophic. Even minor skirmishes can result in fatal injuries due to their sheer size and their devastating chemical blast. Sustaining a 30-ton apex predator requires enormous caloric intake, even with a slow reptilian metabolism. Thermoradiosaurus is both opportunistic and highly specialized. Its diet includes large marine creatures and occasionally terrestrial megafauna, but its primary food source actually comes from massive schools of fish. Its foraging cycle operates through a series of interdependent behaviors. It begins with chemical harvesting in which the creature extracts peroxide and other reactive compounds from microbial mats growing on radioactive sands. Once its chemical stores are ready, it engages in prey localization, detecting and swimming towards dense schools of fish. Upon reaching its target, the predator uses its massive body to herd and compact the prey, concentrating them into tight maneuverable groups. Finally, it executes its signature chemical blast, delivering a high-pressure, high-temperature attack with precision to incapacitate or kill large numbers of fish. Each step of the cycle is essentially for maximizing energy intake while minimizing unnecessary effort, allowing the species to sustain its enormous size. While this may not seem like a lot of food at first glance, Large schools of fish can contain tens to hundreds of tons of biomass, more than enough to sustain an adult Thermoradiosaurus for days or even weeks at a time. Thermoradiosaurus colossus is the ultimate apex predator, facing virtually no natural enemies. Its massive size, armored hide, and chemical weaponry render adult individuals untouchable to almost any other predator in Earth's history. Competition primarily comes from other members of its species, and adults defend their territories ferociously. Juveniles are the only vulnerable stage potentially exposed to predation from smaller apex predators. However, the species' extreme parental care ensures that juvenile mortality from predation is exceptionally rare, as few creatures in Earth's history would be bold enough to challenge a protective adult Thermoradiosaurus. Unlike its spinosaur relatives, this species survived the infamous KT extinction that wiped out most of the dinosaurs. It survived due to its remarkable ecological flexibility and semi-aquatic lifestyle. While most large terrestrial predators perished, this lineage thrived along coastal regions rich in radiolytic sands and microbial mats, feeding efficiently on massive schools of fish while supplementing its diet with smaller terrestrial prey. Over millions of years, it gradually grew larger, an adaptation that helped maintain body temperature in a cooling world through gigantothermy. Its longevity, slow metabolism, and near total absence of natural predators allowed it to remain largely insulated from environmental upheavals that eliminated other apex predators. By the time humans emerged, this creature had already become the foundation for countless legends, stories that many assumed were purely mythical. But in this case, the monsters were real. 
Sightings along the coast of Asia, Africa, and the Indo-Pacific inspired tales of dragons, sea serpents, and other gigantic monsters. Sailor's logs, coastal folklore, and early chronicles describe massive scaly tyrants of the seas, titanic predators capable of capsizing boats and boiling entire armies alive. Here are two of the most iconic recorded instances of human interaction with the species, one from the ancient Roman Empire and one from the late 20th century. In 65 CE, a juvenile specimen was captured along the coast of the Indian Ocean and transported to Rome, crated in reinforced wooden and iron cages. Even as a juvenile, it already measured over 50 feet in length and dwarfed every other creature ever brought into the Colosseum, making it the largest living animal the arena had ever seen or ever would. The journey took months, demanding constant vigilance and careful feeding to prevent the creature from breaking free. Staged in a Naumachiae, a flooded arena designed for mock naval battles, the juvenile Spinosaur unleashed its terrifying power. Gladiators in small boats armed with nets and spears confronted it, however they didn't stand a chance. The creature reacted instinctively. A jet of superheated water and reactive chemicals erupted from its throat sac, scalding combatants, splintering wooden rafts, filling the arena with choking steam, blinding both spectators and guards as screams echoed off the stone walls. The Spinosaur's attacks mirrored its natural hunting tactics. Using its massive body, it herded struggling humans into tight clusters before unleashing precise violent bursts from its chemical boiler. Every strike left a wake of chaos, water, and scorched wood, yet the juvenile remained largely unharmed, its reinforced hide mostly shrugging off spears. The arena had transformed into a maelstrom of water, steam, and terror. Rome had never witnessed anything like it. Afterward, the juvenile was moved to a heavily fortified coastal pen, far from the city, but the spectacle had left an undeniable mark. Mosaics depicting the sea dragon of the Colosseum appeared across the empire, and senatorial records chronicled the futility of human attempts to control such a force of nature. Even the emperor himself considered weaponizing the creature for naval combat or military displays, but it quickly became clear that its instincts, power, and aggression were far too unpredictable to harness reinforcing the lesson that some forces of nature simply would not bend to human will. By the late 20th century, one adult Thermoradiosaurus began an unprecedented upriver migration into the Cherry Noble Exclusion Zone, drawn by sediments with unusually high background radiation. Reports trickled in from local fishermen and wildlife officers, fleeting glimpses at night of a massive shadowy figure moving silently through the river scarring the water's surface with its immense bulk and leaving behind scorched fish kills or plumes of steam rising from otherwise calm waters. Many dismissed these stories as rumors or misidentified sturgeon, but the pattern persisted. When a research team entered the zone to study the effects of radiation on local ecosystems, they encountered the creature firsthand. It surfaced without warning, expelling a jet from its throat sac that sent boiling water and reactive brine hissing across the river, forcing the scientists to retreat. Over several days, it hunted with terrifying efficiency, exploiting the radiation-rich environment to amplify the chemical reactions powering its superheated blast. The encounter highlighted the full power of its weapon system, while demonstrating an adaptability far beyond that of any other known vertebrate. Throughout history, humans had attempted to control or eliminate Thermoradiosaurus, either out of fear or to assert dominance. Smaller individuals were occasionally trapped or poisoned, but fully grown adults remained untouchable. By the modern era, human activity like overfishing, habitat destruction, and environmental pollution had reduced populations dramatically. The species survives now in isolated coastal refuges, remote marine zones, and select inland waterways where they continue to hunt with precision and power. Thanks for watching this episode of Evolve Fiction. The art for this video was created by Delta Reaper 54, so if you want to see more like it, be sure to go check out their work. Their info will be in the description below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you won't miss any future content. And a special shout out to our channel members. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, stay curious, and I'll see you all in the next video.